Our national parks, very popular with people, not so welcoming for wildlife. We'll ask why. Welcome to the programme and welcome to Dartmoor, where we'll be asking why, despite the rugged beauty of our national parks, they're not really doing enough to help with the nature recovery. Also on the programme... As Ireland plans to massively increase its forest cover, why are activists pulling up saplings? It causes me almost physical pain to have to tell you that this show is all about climate change. <laughs> and... I speak to the comedian making climate funny at this year's Edinburgh Fringe. First though, these places are national parks, not natural parks. Nevertheless, what could be done to improve wildlife here? Time for a trek. This is Dartmoor National Park. 953 square kilometres of landscape designated for the whole nation. It boasts a kind of sparse beauty, but I want to check on the natural state of this national park, and what better way to do that than wild camping under the stars. Got to find a position that's flattish without too much dung. And that's one of the problems. Dartmoor is a grazed landscape with 145,000 sheep, plus some cows and ponies chewing on much that grows. And that's typical of our national parks. They're not great wildernesses of nature like Banff or Yosemite in North America. Large parts of them are quite barren. Not quite the glorious morning I was hoping for. Still a bit of an adventure though. Spending the night here, I was struck by the absolute silence. No hooting owls or rustles of wild animals in the night. So why is it like this? I'm going to meet some of the people involved in managing this landscape and those who want to change it. Our national parks are in a pretty shocking state for nature. Um, studies have been done looking at the condition of the nature reserves within our national parks. And they've actually found that on average they're in a worse condition than the nature reserves outside our national parks. And this is after millions and millions of pounds of public money has been spent trying to improve uh, the condition of these sites. Do you think uh, national parks have a sort of particular, almost responsibility here? Absolutely. I mean, you know, the government signed up to this target of protecting 30% of England's land for nature by 2030. We're currently at somewhere around 3% of our country is protected properly for nature. If we're going to get anywhere close to that target within that short space of time, national parks have a crucial role to play in that. They cover about 10% of the land mass of England. We have to get them in a much better state for nature. National parks were not set up solely with nature in mind. They were about landscape. They were about the people that work here. You're just trying to change what they're all about, aren't you? And, and, and make them entirely for nature, not about people. No, I think that there's always going to be a role for farming in our national parks but I do think that the things have got out of balance, they've got out of kilter, and we're in a, a climate and ecological emergency now. I think that nature has to be prioritised. If, if not in our national parks, then where? There are many people involved in our national parks, and this one is no different. In fact, 47% of Dartmoor has 14 owners, including royals. The Duchy of Cornwall, run by the Prince of Wales, is the biggest landowner with 271 square kilometres and it generates a significant income. The Duchy is behind some restoration projects like planned expansion of a pocket of temperate rainforest, but critics say it could do much more. Tom, Tom. Hi, nice to see you. I'm visiting a farm on the western side of the Duchy estate where curlews brought from East Anglia are about to be released. So this is the uh, rearing uh, pan. Wow. But what else are they planning to enhance biodiversity? It's one part of a suite of um, work that we're doing in the area of sustainability. We've always been very, very keen on, on um, environmental enhancement. So curly um, being a red-listed species is really top of the list, really. The Dutch have been in control of this land for quite a long time, and you've seen some wildlife declines in that period. How come? There's been um, 
extensive destocking of both the enclosed land and some of the commons, um, fewer which animals, is, fewer animals, which has cre created an imbalance. So um, this work is actually quite a good practical example of um, trying to um, redress that balance, mm. um, working closely with the farmers and the commoners as well, whose stock are all important to achieving the changes that we need. But many wildlife charities don't share that rosy view of the impact of livestock farmers in national parks. Hi, guys. Neil Cole's herd grazed the land where the curlews will be released. Hey, 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 settle down, settle down. When it comes to Dartmoor and the nature of the place here, the wildlife, a lot of people think farmers are rather the villain of the piece. Is that fair? Uh, no, totally the opposite. I think it's very unfair. Um, there are certain issues with farming in nature, but generally, the population's got to be fed, but we look after our wildlife and we farm in tune with the wildlife. Over the last you know, 40, 50 years, there's been a lot of education in this country between the environment, food and farming. We would like to say here, we farm in line with nature. We help nature where we can, but we also have to provide food. I think it's a human population problem is nature's biggest problem, not me solely as a farmer. The vexed question of how much grazing is right for Dartmoor is due to be answered by a government-backed report expected out this autumn. But even their own reports aren't always implemented. Four years ago, the government commissioned an independent review to look at the future of our national parks. Amongst other things, it recommended that they should have a duty to enhance nature. That hasn't been taken up. I think if you talk to people within national parks, they feel quite disappointed that we haven't moved faster than we have on some of the proposals that we had in the Glover Review. Sarah Mukherjee was one of the report authors. We should have parks that are vibrant for people, but vibrant for nature as well, that are special, that feel special and look special. And we suggested there should be a statutory responsibility or duty to support that nature, because if it's not happening here, where is it happening? People already view these as the crown jewels of British landscapes, of English landscapes as well. Uh, and there's a real opportunity to do something about, to really drive that biodiversity and nature conservation within national parks. At the moment, I think it's difficult to see where that's happening. <laughs> okay. Each national park is run by an authority with some control over planning, but little real power other than encouraging different groups to talk to each other. How popular is this place? Haytor alone, about a quarter of a million visitors per annum. Dartmoor, about 18 million. Kevin Bishop is chief executive of the Dartmoor National Park. Are you happy with the state of nature within your national park? No, there's always scope to do more, isn't there? But, but we're not the place that nature comes to die in. And if you look at uh, Devon Bird Atlas and things like that, we're actually the place where nature seeks sanctuary. But we don't want to be a sanctuary. We want to be a beating heart of the nature recovery network. But there's a key issue, what tools have we got? What powers have we got? What resources? Nature would recover if you were able to manage the natural landscape better. Do you have sufficient powers to do that? As a National Park yes. Authority, no. We don't have those powers. We don't have the powers. We don't have the resources to do it at present. Now, the government could change our purposes, but without giving us the powers and without giving us the pounds, new purposes are, in essence, meaningless. And the power he really wants is to be able to change the behaviour of farmers. The most important tool in my book for nature recovery is probably agri-environment agreements. Uh, so that's the money that government pays to farmers to deliver public goods. We have no formal role in the current agri-environment schemes other than farming and protected landscapes. National parks then can't change significantly on their own. Their future rests on the powers we decide to give them. Not enough wild places and the climate crisis are a big issue in the Republic of Ireland too. And there, the government thinks more tree cover could be a big part of the solution. But as Stephen Murphy reports, many people think they're going for the wrong kind of trees. This is the unusual sight of environmentalists tearing up newly planted saplings. The activists in County Leitrim in Ireland's northwest are protesting against the ubiquitous Sitka spruce, king of Ireland's reforestation efforts, 
to the detriment, they say, of native species. Environmentalists are people who clearly care a lot about the environment pulling up saplings. Uh, why? Everybody is, should be part of the solution. So the problem is wider than just pulling up those trees. Climate change is dramatic, hugely impactful, and it has to be addressed. Ireland is Europe's least forested country. At one stage, just 1% of land was forested. Now that's up to 11%, compared to an EU average of 35%. The Sitka spruce, native to North America, is everywhere. These spruces have come to dominate Irish forestry because they're so lucrative. They grow much faster than native Irish species and can therefore be turned into timber products at a much earlier stage, many of those destined for export to places like the UK. But campaigners say the conifer plantations are dense, sterile and lacking in biodiversity and purely commercially motivated. The focus there is on timber and profit from timber only. So we are trying to bring the focus back to addressing the climate issues. The EU has just approved Ireland's new 1.3 billion euro plan to reach 18% forest cover by 2050. The minister with responsibility for forestry says mistakes have been made in the past with Ireland's reliance on spruce trees. There are legacy issues, certainly with the way we have planted conifer plantations. Um, we've, you know, in the past we've planted on deep peat, we've planted too close to rivers, to communities, to roads. We're aware of that now and we're, we're very much trying to address a lot of that now in this new programme. The timber industry says there are new limits on the planting of Sitka spruces, but making money is key to persuading farmers to plant new trees. Even in the commercial forests, only 65% of the trees in those forests are going to be Sitka spruce. The other 35% is going to be broad leaves and set aside for biodiversity. So the forests that we get in the future are going to be naturally diverse because that is the way the new programme is designed. And you as an industry are, are confident that, that will still deliver enough timber for the industry? I think there's an issue there in terms of attracting landowners, attracting farmers into planting forestry because the more of the commercial crop you take away, it makes it less attractive for them. So it's a balancing act, getting more trees into the ground, but with greater diversity and a more holistic approach, as Ireland strives to offset emissions and become more of an emerald isle again. Stephen Murphy, Sky News. August is Fringe Month in Edinburgh, where comedians and other artists flock in great numbers to the Scottish capital. It can be difficult to stand out from the crowd, and yet Stuart Goldsmith's show is proving a great hit, some might say, despite its subject matter. It causes me almost physical pain to have to tell you that this show is all about climate change. <laughs> I know, I know, I don't want to hear about it either. Stuart encourages audiences to laugh at themselves by sharing their guilty climate confessions, something that reviewers have hailed as cathartic. We cannot wait to purge ourselves of all our carbon guilt before we feel like we're allowed to have an opinion. No matter whether you take the catalytic converters off your car, you monster, or, or whether you leave, some guy said he leaves the freezer door open during the last heat wave to cool them, does it even make any sense? Or my, my, the worst one ever, my friend, you're off the hook, my friend Ian, during the last heat wave in the UK, he would shower in speedos and then walk dripping wet to the car and sit in it with the engine running in the air con off, right? <laughs> Even he is a louder voice. And I'm delighted to say that Stuart joins me now. Um, Stuart, it's an incredible mixture, isn't it? We've got comedy, we've got guilt, we've got confessions. <laughs> let, let, let's start with the latter. Let's have some climate confessions out of you. You show me yours, I'll show you mine. OK, OK, so here's one of mine. I, um, I noticed on day two of the festival that loads of the big comedy venues, the big multi-venue venues, I'd been drinking coffee from, uh, from my little reusable cup and I've been doing that the whole time and then I suddenly realised I was drinking pints from a plastic cup and I thought, I must do, I'm going to make a huge think about this and I'm going to get them to change the whole way they use those disposable plastic cups and we're going to use more reusable ones and then I didn't get round to it because I was busy. <laughs> well I have to say I, I've got one a little bit which is I'm still a bit of a wood burning addict which used to be a good thing but is now considered a bit of a bad thing. Live in the countryside so perhaps less, less bad but I know a lot of people would be uh, scorning me for that and despite the fact I have an electric car I can't quite give up my big Subaru 
which still sits yes. there with its 3.6 liter engine. Um, so yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Vehicles, vehicles are a biggie. Yeah, they, they are a biggie. But I mean, it's so important, isn't it, to get beyond this feeling of shame and guilt, basically get in, in my case, uh, a, a journalist, but almost your, in your case, you're talking about climate, get us out of the pulpit. Yes, I think the most useful thing we can do, the, use, the most useful thing I can do is to try and inspire a sort of trickle up gentle radicalization. Like I think one of the things that, that really gets in everyone's way is this idea that we might be seen as a hypocrite, like, oh, I've got to purge myself of all of my carbon guilt before I dare to have a voice. And actually, I think there's a bit in the show where I talk about how um, if you have, a, you know, a Subaru or a, the Range Rover Evoque, which is the dream car I've sworn I will never own. Um, but if you've got one, don't let the fact that you've got one stop you driving to a climate protest. Like, drive it there. Don't park too close, maybe. <laughs> you know, But don't let the fact that you are a participant in the carbon economy make you feel like, oh, I, I don't have a voice then. I, it, it's not my place to say anything or make a fuss. Being concerned about climate can't be a killjoy space, can it? You have to find delight. You have to find delight. And I've been dying in comedy clubs for 18 months as I learn how to make the climate funny. Because obviously, if I try a new joke about ocean acidification it, and they don't laugh, I can't just move on because now they're all sad and they're angry for making me feel make it, for me making them feel sad. So you have to you have to find a silliness. And it, it, over the last six months, it, fortunately, the show started to come together when I remembered that my favourite thing to do on stage is to be silly. So I would try to lean into that because we need to we need to sort of accept that we're all part of it and and kind of start from that base together and try and have a laugh about it to to, to drag some of those negative toxic feelings into the light. You kind of hinted at this already, but where do you think this humour and engagement gets you? Now, I'd have to say, if the answer is just a great hour and a half night out, that's fine. <laughs> that's important. But do you think it also gets somewhere beyond that? Yes, absolutely. What I've been trying to do across the whole process is really dig into how am I coping with my activism? How am I coping with my climate dread? You know, that dread that I feel every morning when I wake up and I remember, you know, I'm boodling along in the kitchen and I suddenly go, oh, my God, it's slid back into my brain. I wanted to work out how am I coping with that? So I wanted to look at kind of psychological theories as to how to cope with it. The fact that sometimes I slide between wild hope and desperate pessimism. And as soon as I learned along the way, oh, that is a common thing because of course you do. So actually I can accept that and I can own it. Other people will be feeling it who haven't got as far as that understanding yet. And I can actually start spreading a bit more positivity about how to go, look, this is terrifying. We're not going to fix it if we sit at the bottom of a well in our minds going, I can't cope with this. I, I just want to give up. I want to not think about it because it's too frightening. But first duty still to be funny. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've been a comic long enough. I just purely take that for granted. <laughs> Stuart, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Tom. Well, we're off to a break now. But when we come back, the UK's top beauty contest for trees which one will you leave your light on for? Welcome back to the show. The benefits of spending time in nature to our mental health have long been known, but could it now be prescribed to help us and save the NHS money? Inzaman Rashid has been finding out. Go on, you go down first, Amo. It's long been proven that being outdoors is good for our health, and now it could also help save our NHS. For this group in Greater Manchester, struggling with various illnesses, a green prescription through a natural health service is proving vital. And I'll do this, and then if you guys don't mind spreading it out and carrying on the path. At Phillips Park in Bury, tucked away from the chaos of the M62, Jenny's Nature and Wellbeing Group are up and running with creating a new path. For Damien, Paul and Joe, this sort of access to the outdoors has been life-saving. Groups like this, they, they make me get up because some, some mornings I just feel like I don't want to get up. But because I come here on a Friday, I get up and then that sets me up the rest of the day. I just know I'm going to go away with a smile on me. I come with a smile on my face and, and that is... That is something. That's a, that's a huge impact on your mental health. I think uh, whether it's out walking your dog or getting out in nature is... Um, really helps to clear your mind. It's, it's where we're supposed to be, it's, yeah. And not only is this targeted treatment helping those who need it, it's alleviating pressures from our NHS too. In fact, new economic analysis from the Wildlife Trusts suggests green prescribing could save the health service over £635 million a year. 
the kind of money the NHS is crying out for. The NHS is, is fantastic, you know, universal healthcare free at the point of access, but it, it can't and was never designed to go it alone. And so I think um, where you've got um, health that is closer to the community and natural environment, local parks and green spaces, the fantastic stuff you've seen today, is much closer to those kind of communities and where people live. It just makes a lot more sense to do something social, something meaningful that gets people together and, and prevents more serious illness from uh, developing. These types of classes in the outdoors is something the Wildlife Trusts is trying to introduce across the country. They know firsthand how effective they can be. Because you're in this kind of space um, and nature works its magic, it just provides that safe space for people to flourish, to be themselves with zero judgment. And you see that, that transformation and people feeling confident to share and happy to share. Um, yeah, you really start to see that, that boost in well-being, also physical fitness as well. Nature does bring all kinds of health and well-being benefits, but now knowing it can work alongside and reduce the reliance on our already struggling health service is yet another reason to access it more now than ever before. In Zaman Rashid, Sky News, Berry. Next up, the Woodland Trust's answer to Miss World. They've asked the people of the UK to choose the tree of the year and they're focusing on ancient trees in urban locations. So, let's meet the contestants. First up, she's sweet natured, although can be a little spiky. It's Greenwich Park's sweet chestnut, planted at the request of King Charles II nearly 400 years ago. Now the contorted, decomposing trunk offers an important habitat for wildlife in the park. Next up, we've got a bit of blitz spirit. This oak in Exeter survived one of the city's worst shellings on the 4th of May 1942. 20 bombers flew over in the dead of night and devastated the city, but this oak tree survived. Locally, the tree is seen as a symbol of hope and strength. The next contestant may live in humble surroundings, but this walnut in a retail park in Perth is far from ordinary. It's been a landmark for 300 years for travellers heading to the Highlands, and today they still admire its unusual look amid the concrete. And we may just have saved the best to last. This is the glorious beaver oak in Belfast. Clocking in at over 500 years old and 8 metres wide, it may be the oldest tree in Northern Ireland. This gnarly survivor has seen it all, from war and conflict to Belfast's growth from a settlement to a thriving city. You can vote for your favourite on the Woodland Trust website up until the 15th of October. You know what? I might actually plump for a plain tree. That's it for now. Remember you can catch up on all your climate and environment news on the Sky News website and app or by scanning the QR code that is on your screen right now. We're off for our summer break back in a month or so, the 23rd of September, fully recharged. I do hope we'll see you then.